because we're ready to go. Yeah, cool. All right, folks, uh, welcome to this uh, special lecture. Um, so today we have uh, Mark Mancy, who has agreed to give a talk. Mark is a PhD student here in the systems group. He works on um, operating systems with uh, how, and how they deal with very large memory. Um, and he happens to also be a Rust hacker, uh, not only writing programs in Rust, but actually hacking on the Rust compiler, which is called Rust C. Um, so this is, you know, one of the probably most popular languages these days, very actively developed and used. And um, he's going to tell us all about it. Uh, I personally find it really hard to learn, uh, but it turns out, you know, a lot of people love it. So maybe it's something <laughs> that's deficient in me. Uh, but uh, please ask him questions as he goes along. Of course, you know, our knowledge of compilers is pretty basic at this point, and this is a very advanced uh, state-of-the-art compiler. So if you have any questions, just stop and be like, what the heck is this? Uh, please explain. Right. Mark. Thank you. Uh, can people hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. So thanks for that intro. Uh, yeah, as you said, um, please interrupt me if something is not clear. So I'll talk about a few things. Um, first, I'll give a really quick primer on Rust so that we have kind of a sense of what kind of language are we trying to compile. And then we'll talk about like how does Rust C build, how is it built um, at a high level? Um, and then we'll talk about um, other considerations that maybe go beyond just generating binaries. So there are a couple of takeaways that I'd like to, I'd like you to look for throughout this talk. Um, the first is that um, the design and the performance of the compiler itself is heavily influenced by the design of the programming language that you're trying to compile. The second one is that compiler design has a lot of considerations that go beyond just generating binaries. Um, and we'll talk more about what those are. So a quick intro to Rust. Um, what is it? It's a low level language, um, targets high performance. You can think of it as kind of a C++, um, like that class of programming languages, low, very low level, close to the middle, um, no runtime, um, no like uh, language level threading library or JIT compiler or anything. Um, it originally targeted systems programming, but it's kind of expanded to encompass a lot of things, including, for whatever reason, a lot of people use it for building CLI tools um, or WebAssembly applications or that sort of thing. Um, and the kind of calling card of Rust, uh, the thing that apparently makes it very popular um, and differentiates it from a lot of other languages is the emphasis on both memory safety and practicality. So there's kind of like a long spectrum of programming languages um, that are on one side really safe, but extremely hard to use. And on the other side, um, you, you can think of like C, which is really fast and close to the metal and easy to use, but you can shoot yourself in the foot very easily. Um, and Rust tries to avoid all of those sorts of memory safety bugs um, and makes them impossible with asterisks. Um, this is accomplished via a strongly typed, um, fairly ex expressive type system. Um, it's all checked statically, so it doesn't have compile time overhead. Um, and the secret sauce is this um, ownership and borrowing concept, which I'll mention briefly. Um, so this is kind of what some Rust looks like. Um, if, Function declarations, we have variable declarations. Um, notice that there's type inference going on, uh, which I think you haven't covered yet. Um, but um, we won't talk a lot about what the algorithms are here, but they're fairly standard um, in Philip Kendi Milner um, type inference. Um, uh, things are immutable by default. We have conditional statements very similar to C or Java or whatever you're used to. Um, we have uh, a standard library full of data structures that are pretty standard. So VEC, um, if you're familiar with C++, is similar to Vector, or if you're familiar with Java, it's like ArrayList. Um, and uh, method calls, very again, very similar to Java or C++ or whatever you're used to. And then we have um, loops. Um, the loops are based on this iterator interface, um, 
which I won't talk about extensively, but um, they're kind of they do kind of what the syntax seems to indicate it, that it does. And then this print line is a standard out um, print to the console. Um, can define custom types um, enumeration. So here it must be one of these values. Am I doing this right? Uh, there we go. Yeah. Right. So it must be one of those values. Or if uh, you can define a struct that's very similar to classes in Java or structs in C or C. Um, the biggest this departure is this trace idea. So a trait is um, the equivalent of an interface in Java or a um, virtual um, parent class in C++. And um, the idea is you're defining uh, some set of methods that you want to implement for a type. Um, so in this case, we can say all, all types that implement pet must have this greet method with this function signature. Um, and the notation here is um, this method takes self. So that's like this in Java or C++ or the self pointer in Python. Um, and it returns a string. And if we want to implement it, um, implement this trait for this type, um, we just say that we're going to implement it and then we define the body of the function. And the last value in here in the body of, of the function is the return value of the function. Um, so uh, one last example. I will erase this. So um, here we're defining a vector and then we maybe add some elements to it and mess with it. And then we have this loop where we iterate over the items and every time we push some new element. And does anyone see the bug here? Let's see. If you're iterating through the vector and then adding stuff to it, is there any number of items? That is true. That's not the bug that I was looking for. Um, but I hadn't thought of that actually. <laughs> several processes are running, there might be chances that somebody is adding and somebody is pushing the element. So there might be those conditions. Yeah, so if you have um, if you have multiple processes, you could get race conditions. But even in the single threaded case, there's a bug here. Um, just hand back there. So you're getting very warm. Um, Rust does not have exceptions, um, but the similar sort of error of what you're getting at. But um, when you're adding elements here, um, so internally vector is implemented as a big array. So you allocate some, like an array of memory on the heap, and then you add elements to the array. And when you run out of space, you allocate a new one and copy all the elements and then free the old one. Uh, now, this iterator is holding a pointer into the old array. Um, and so by pushing elements, you might actually invalidate the iterator. So this could cause you to um, dereference a dangling pointer or something. Um, and I'm just curious, how many people have done this in C++? This is very easy to do in C++. So um, in Rust, this does not compile. Um, and that's kind of the secret sauce of the borrow checker. Um, so um, the error here, it says cannot borrow B as mutable because it's also borrowed as immutable. And what it's saying here is this iterator, uh, let me see. yeah, this, this V dot iter, um, which is what it's highlighting here, is immutably borrowing um, from the, um, is immutably borrowing the, the vector. Um, what that means is it's taking a pointer to the vector. And because um, in Rust, things are either mutable or immutable, um, and they're immutable by default. And so um, this pointer is typed as, in, as a immutable pointer. Um, but at the same time, um, this v.push 
is trying to grab a mutable pointer, and that's what it's <laughs> complaining about here. Um, and in fact, um, and it's telling you that those are in conflict. So the idea here is that in Rust, the borrow checker, in for, uh, which is a part of the type system, enforces that um, you every uh, location in memory has exactly one variable that owns it. Um, and uh, that location can loan out borrows of the value. And um, if there are immutable borrows, you can have any number of immutable borrows at the same time, but you can't have any mutable borrows. And that prevents uh, this kind of dangling pointers that you can't mutate the value under someone else's feet. Um, and at the same time, if you, you can either have a bunch of immutable borrows or you can have one, at most one mutable borrow. Um, and if we look at the definitions of this two methods, push and iter, um, we see that push borrows the vector of the self as mutable um, because it wants to modify the vector. Whereas iter is just reading the vector and it borrows it as immutable. And the borrow checker detects that there's um, both a mutable and an immutable borrow in this loop and prevents that. So that's that's kind of the, um, the secret sauce of Rust, so to speak, um, and how it prevents a lot of memory errors. Um, there's actually a lot more as well. The compiler will track the lifetimes of these um, different references to make sure that they are dropped eventually, or they you don't have dangling pointers, or you don't have double double freeze, that sort of thing. Um, but this is kind of sufficient for for now. Uh, does this kind of make sense to people? Do you have questions or? Yeah. Question. Yes. Uh, what are there classes of memory bugs that you can uh, get in Rust? There Assuming are, you don't write unsafe code. There are, uh, so you can get things that are not safety bugs. So like memory leaks. I see. Um, memory leaks are, are, they are memory bugs, but they're not safety bugs. Um, they, they can't cause undefined behavior. Um, and it's kind of the same thing, uh, the same, actually the same system prevents a lot of data races. Um, as you can kind of see it as, as like a reader writer lock. Um, for those who are familiar with concurrency, um, that a mutable borrow is like a writer lock and a immutable borrow is like a reader lock. So, uh, and there also, though, you can get deadlocks. They're not safety, uh, they're not like data races in a sense. Um, so, yeah. And, and one more question about in the previous slide, you have the print statement, right? And my understanding is that it is implemented as a as a macro, right? That's where yes. the exclamation mark is. Yes. What, what is the design choice behind that? Like, why is it a macro and not a function? So the reason is primarily that Rust doesn't have variadic functions. Uh -huh. um, so you can't have an arbitrary number of uh, arguments. I see. Uh, whereas macros are designed are, like they can take variadic arguments. Um, uh, the macro system is actually pretty interesting on its own. Um, it's designed to be hygienic, meaning that you can't get a lot of the same bugs as C, meaning so like if, if you've done like C preprocessor stuff, um, you know you have to like surround everything with parentheses so that you don't accidentally change precedence and so on. And in Rust, um, macros parse as like little ASTs, uh, and then you insert the whole syntax tree into the bigger syntax tree. So you can't get precedent precedence inversions and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there's there's actually a lot there that's interesting. But um, cool. So um, if you're actually interested in learning more, um, there's a whole book. Um, it's the official Rust programming language book. Um, I'm told it's pretty good. Um, I read a really old version of it, which was less good, but they've done like a few revisions since then. 
Um, and then there's also a like health forum, um, which is pretty active. So we will now talk about how does the Rust compiler actually compile this stuff. Um, first, uh, very high level stuff. So Rust is, or Rust C is primarily front end actually. Um, it does static analysis, it um, does parsing and lexing and all of that stuff. And then it emits this um, intermediate format called LLVM IR, um, LLVM inter intermediate representation. And it uses LLVM as the back, back end. Um, so LLVM, for those who don't know about it, is a pretty cool project. Started, I think, at UIUC as an academic research project and then became a production compiler backend. Um, and a lot of compilers use it um, for generating code. So you emit this bytecode called LLVMIR, and then LLVM takes that stuff and turns it into a binary. Um, and along the way, it has a lot of optimizations in it um, and kind of all of the stuff you would expect in a compiler backend. And um, a lot of programming languages use this to avoid having to implement a bunch of different backends for different architectures, different optimizations, and all of that stuff. It's a lot of work. Um, so if you've ever used like Clang, the C compiler, that also uses LLVM. Um, if you've used Julia, um, that uses LLVM. Um, and there's a bunch of others as well. Um, Rust um, internally is composed of a bunch of queries instead of stages or passes. Um, and we'll talk about what that means in just a moment. Um, it has a lot of static analyses because it um, has an emphasis, the programming language has an emphasis on safety and correctness at compile time. Um, so all of that stuff has to be checked. Um, and then there's a lot of code representations um, that have different purposes and get kind of progressively lower level. And we'll talk about those as well. Um, so first let's talk about queries. Um, so traditionally compilers are thought of as having these passes or stages um, where you kind of do all of the parsing and then do all of the type checking and then do all of the whatever, right? And eventually you get to a binary. In Rust, um, the compiler actually uh, is composed as a bunch of queries um, in this big directed acyclic graph. Um, and there's some kind of exceptions for historical and practical reasons. Um, the, like the very beginning of the compiling process is kind of more traditionally formatted. Um, and then LLVM because it's a separate code base. Um, and the queries themselves happen at the level of bodies. So like an individual function, a um, type definition or whatever. Um, so that's kind of the unit of compilation. Um, so as a, an example, um, there's this uh, query called type check crate. Um, a crate is Rust's name for a package. I have no idea why. Um, and this type check crate type checks the entire package. Um, in order to do this, it will first get a list of all of the items. Um, recall here is one of these intermediate representations and we'll talk more about it. Um, so it's getting a list of all of the items in the crate. So all of the functions, all of the macros, all of the um, uh, type definitions and so on. And so that query executes and returns, and then we keep executing type check crates, and it comes to a place where it needs to actually type check the individual items. So now we can execute these two queries um, before we can finish executing the other query. Um, so arbitrarily, let's say we start with this type check bar item, um, and that tries to do type inference. So there's another query to do type inference, this type of. Um, and it turns out, say that bar is a struct that contains another type foo. So we need to type check foo first. Um, and so we um, 
get the type of foo. And that requires first getting the here of foo, the, the intermediate representation. Um, and then we can kind of unwind um, the stack as you see. Um, and then finally we get the here of bar. And we can type check, we can infer the type of bar and then we can type check bar and then we can keep going. And so on. so this, this kind of like graph of um, dependent queries, that's how Rust is structured, Rust C is structured. Um, is the goal to make it parallelizable um, or? That's a great question, if it'll advance to the next slide. Cool, yeah. So why do we do this? Uh, the reason is incremental compilation. Um, in C or Java or whatever, um, if you ever, um, you, you probably like invoked GCC or Java C directly. And usually you invoke it on a small set of files or a single file that uh, you compile that whole file on its own. Um, in Rust, you can't do that because it doesn't have header files and it doesn't have a bytecode format like Java. Um, so you have to compile the whole package all at once. As you can imagine, this can get very slow if you have a large code base. Um, and so uh, the goal is this um, DAG of queries is that once you have this DAG of queries, you can serialize the whole DAG onto disk and make that a cache. Um, and then you can, on your next, uh, the next time you invoke the compiler, you can only rerun the queries that have changed. Um, so you can check the cache and see um, what parts have changed. And because it's a DAG, you know what parts are dependent. So you know what to rerun afterwards. Um, this actually requires a lot of work. Um, it influences the whole structure of the compiler. Um, and it has a lot of interesting um, implications for how you uh, assign identifiers within the compiler, for example, that they have to be stable across compilations because otherwise you can't identify if this item has changed or not. Um, to your question, um, there was work on parallelizing um, because now you have a big bag of dependencies, you know what can run in, in uh, parallel with each other. Um, and it turns out that this is, um, it's possible, but it's very difficult um, just because there's a lot of lock contention if you do it naively. Um, but that is an effort that is, that has been um, tried and then kind of the compiler team got busy with other stuff. Um, but there's, there is interest in doing parallelization of that sort. Does this make sense? Is there like a specific caching uh, you know, algorithm that you use? Like, how do you, how do you, like, for example, I run two packages. So technically, I would have to like cache it differently, or how do you prioritize that, which is important and which to keep it on this? Because again, again, I cannot. You know, like what what do you cache is that your question or yeah technically not what do you cache like how do you cache it like what do you choose to go on this step yeah so that's that's a great question what do you choose to actually serialize to disk um naively you could choose to serialize the entire dag um that is not what they do because it's it would be very large um um it's actually done on a query to query basis. So whoever is implementing the query um, annotates the query to say, serialize this one or always rerun it or whatever. Um, I don't have a really good idea of like what they use to determine when to do that. I think a lot of it is trial and error. Like they used to serialize this one and then they found out that it doesn't help or it's redundant with serializing another one or whatever. Uh, that's a great question, but I, I don't, can't give you a really great answer to that. So for example, you have to cache your module and uh, would you like to optimize it later for this before the cache? And what if like another module for it and uh, like further optimization that might happen because inside the cache. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. The um, the the queries uh, don't all happen. Uh, most of them happen actually before optimization. So most of the information that's cached is kind of agnostic to optimizations. Um, and in fact, a lot of the optimizations happen either at the very end of the compilation session or they happen in LLVM. And um, the LLVM steps aren't cached because they're just a separate code base altogether. Um, so yeah, so it's um, the, like the primary optimization that this enables is being able to skip steps that haven't changed from the previous um, uh, from the previous compilation session, um, and it doesn't really, to my knowledge, affect like the optimization of the binary itself as much. So it's like the like the cache stuff is basically like still like intermediate in some way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the yeah, all of the cache stuff is various serialized forms of the intermediate representations or like the um, various side tables that are generated or that sort of thing. When you say uh, stable hashing, do you mean consistent hashing? Uh, I mean um, I mean that the hashes remain the same um, for items that haven't changed between compilation sessions. So if I change one function, all of the other functions have the same identifiers between compilation function or compilation sessions. Um, that's that's required so that you can tell what changed. Otherwise you don't know what to compare against what. Are you going to talk about the the various intermediate presentations. So. I will, okay. yes. Cool. Um, so just to give a sense of like how much or how little this helps. Um, so um, this is kind of Rust's like dashboard. They have this website perf.rustlang.org um, and they have this kind of average time, which is a bunch of different benchmarks that are averaged together. It's not really a super great, um, like it's not very representative and it's very generic, but uh, there's like a significant improvement just from not repeating a lot of work. Um, so this is kind of like the best case. Um, you can get like, a, you know, roughly halving of the compilation time. Okay, so what all does the compiler need to do? Um, so now we've seen like this querying structure, but like what are the queries actually doing? Um, so there's a lot of steps. Um, the first one actually is not parsing and lexing. It is loading all of the like configuration stuff. So figuring out where is the standard library and um, like, like, what are the command line args that were passed, and what do we actually need to emit? Um, is it LLVM IR, or do, are we just not emitting a binary at all? Or are we just doing static analysis, or um, are we emitting like assembly or object code or something? Um, what uh, tool chain are we using? So um, we'll talk a bit more about this later, but you could have multiple versions of Rusty installed. Um, and you could have multiple versions of LLVM installed. Um, and you might not even be compiling for the target that you're compiling on. Um, so like you could be on x86 compiling for ARM or um, some embedded processor or something. Um, and then loading the compilation cache or locating it um, and loading it. Lexing and parsing, which I think you all should be somewhat familiar with. Um, macro expansion. Um, there's also these other kind of magic key features. So um, feature gating is like being able to turn on or off um, different features that are still in development. Um, depending on whether you're using the stable compiler or some experimental compiler, you may want, like you will have to check um, if things are allowed to be used or not. And that's what feature gating is. And then there's a bunch of compiler magic around like 
importing like the prelude, um, all of the stuff that's imported for free, so you don't have to manually import it, um, or um, determining whether to import the standard library or go without or stuff like that. Um, if you're like on an embedded processor, you don't have like necessarily um, system calls, so you might not want to have the standard library. Um, type inference. So um, in the previous examples, we didn't have to write any of the types, um, and the compiler has to figure out what all the types are. So that's something that needs to be done. Um, type checking, which is figuring out now. Now we know what all the types are. Are they reasonable? Are they uh, is are do things change types, which they shouldn't? Um, that wouldn't be allowed. Um, there's trait solving um, or checking. So what that is is like. If you had a trait foo, um, you can actually define a generic function that has some generic type T. And you can say T has to implement this trait. Um, and because different T's might implement the trait differently, um, you actually have to know, um, first of all, you have to answer for, for the type checking, does T implement foo? Otherwise it's a type error. And then second, you have to figure out which implementation of foo to use, because that influences what code you generate. Uh, and so, for example, um, if um, integer and the string type um, Im implement foo differently, you would emit different code. Um, or maybe one of them doesn't implement foo, and so that would be an error. Um, there's pattern and exhaustiveness checking. So, um, in Rust, there's this like pattern matching uh, uh, construct called match. Um, so given some variable X, we can kind of match on a structure. And um, we need to make sure that we match all of the possible possibilities. Um, so the, that's just one of the properties of this match. You have to, um, you have to provide all of the alternatives. Uh, and so in this case, um, x is an integer. Obviously, there are more integers than just 0, 1, and 2. So this would be an error. Um, so we need to check uh, if the pattern matching is exhaustive. Uh, there's borrow checking, which we talked about earlier. Um, there's constant evaluation. So Rust has compile time constants, kind of like C++, um, if you've used constexpr or something of that sort. And uh, this is basically executing a bunch of code at compile time and then just putting the result in whatever place you used it in the program. Um, and that has to be done as well during compile time. Could you talk about a little bit about the borrow checker? So the borrow checker is kind of one of the most, one of the biggest uh, novelties. Of Rust, yeah. Right? And like how much time does it take? Is it just a linear pass? Is it more complicated? It's a bit more complicated. Um, I will talk about a bit more about it in the um, when we talk about the mid-level IR here. Um, I didn't go into a lot of detail because it's actually kind of complicated. Um, but um, like generally speaking, it's um, it relies on a bunch of data flow passes, so it's. Uh, kind of a lot of um, linear passes and then some like set logic, I believe. So I think it's I think it's less than n squared in the size of your program, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but yeah, um, I it's been a while since I played with the borrow checker and. It's a bit fuzzy in my memory, to be honest. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of Rust level optimizations. So um, the Rust compiler itself knows a bunch of stuff semantically that LLVM won't know. Um, and so it can do some optimizations. Um, there's monomorphization, which is taking all of the um, like generic types, like this vector of T and then you have to stamp out a bunch of copies with um, integer or string. Uh, this is also what C++ does. It's not what Java does. 
Um, so there are other points in the design space here, but Rust opts for this design because it increases performance generally. Uh, I think one of the uh, cool features of Rust is uh, Yeah, yeah. So the um, lifetime, lifetimes and borrow checking all kind of go together. Um, a lot of the ownership and mutability checks are also done around the same time. Um, a lot of those are um, data flow passes. Uh, we'll talk about those a bit more as well. Um, then there's, you know, saving the compilation cache, emitting LLVM IR, and then running LLVM itself. Um, and LLVM does a whole bunch more optimizations, binary generation, linking of the binary. Um, and then there's actually a bunch of optimizations that happen after linking um, called link time optimizations. So, uh, and we won't talk as much about the LLVM side of things, but it is really a kind of amazing tool. Okay, so among this list of things, um, each of these is done on a particular um, intermediate representation. So um, these initial steps happen um, on AST. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so all, um, I mean, command line parsing and all of that happens before we generate the AST as well. But um, lexing and parsing, we generate the uh, abstract syntax tree, um, very similar to what y'all are fam familiar with. Uh, macro expansion and feature gating and all of that stuff also happens on the AST. Um, so the macros themselves expand to little fragments of the AST and then they're just inserted into the tree. Um, and then a lot of the feature gating and other compiler magic happens by either generating fragments of ASTs and inserting them or else checking properties of while you're generating the AST. Um, and as y'all are probably familiar um, by now, this, uh, the purpose is to represent the program syntactically. Um, and it's fairly easy to generate from the source code and all. Um, the next one is the high level IR here. Um, it's kind of a desugared, more compiler friendly AST. Um, it's fairly easy to build. Um, it gets rid of things like loops. Um, so, or, or like, like high level loops, like for or while. Um, they compile, compile down to this loop construct, which is an infinite loop. And then it inserts a conditional statement with a break or a continue or whatever. Um, and this is the IR where um, like a lot of the like type checking happens, um, not borrow checking. Um, so the borrow checking happens later um, and also not pattern exhaustiveness, but um, like trade inference or type inference and trade solving and that sort of stuff largely happens here. So uh, just to give you a context, so in this class, um, at least for the compiler wheel that we're building, so we just stick to the AST that we built from right. the parser and then you know uh, do some type checking on it and then we will be compiling it in the final assignment. Right. So what is what is the advantage of going to this higher order uh, or like kind of uh, cleaned up AST, desugared AST to do the type checking in the case? Like what does it buy you? Can you just um, the original one? You could, but by doing some of the desugaring, it kind of simplifies a lot of things. So there are a lot of features that just are equivalent to each other and it would be redundant to implement them over and over again, um, like loops. Um, a lot of the like pattern matching conditions break down into match plus a loop or something else. Um, so a lot of the constructs reduce significantly. Um, and then the here also has a bunch of um, uh, like it, it drops a lot of information. So for example, a lot of the white space or comments or that sort of thing are dropped um, uh, and other annotations. Um, you have to have those in the AST because otherwise you can't do pre-printing or, um, or formatting of the code or printing nice error messages, um, but they're not useful to carry around everywhere. Questions? <laughs> 
So the next is the typed here, which is kind of an intermediate step. Um, and really the only thing that happens here is just pattern exhaustiveness checking. Um, and it's mostly this format is, um, the, this IR is meant as a stepping stone to the next one. Um, so we've done most of the type checking at this point, um, minus borrow checking. And um, this is meant to just be easy to generate the next IR from the here. Um, so then there's the mirror, uh, mid-level IR. So this is, uh, this is the most significant step. Um, so the mid-level IR is a control flow graph. Um, so I don't think y'all have done control flow graphs yet, right? So a control flow graph is a representation that uh, represents all of the basic blocks of the program. So any piece of code that runs continuously without a jump to somewhere else. So whenever you have a loop or a conditional or a function call or something like that, that's uh, the end of a basic block and the start of a new one. And um, so you end up with something that looks like this. So you have um, a bunch of continuous instructions that all run. So you know, like if you start executing the first one, you will execute all the way to the end of that basic block. Um, and then you'll jump somewhere else, perhaps conditionally. Um, so for example, um, this is a, this is the switch int is the kind of the low level primitive that all um, conditional things um, break down into in mirror. Um, so um, match statements, conditionals, like if um, loops, all of those sorts of things. Um, so th what this is saying is we have this um, local variable underscore two, which is apparently just true in this case. And depending on its value, we either go to basic block one or to basic block two, and then we keep going. Um, so that's generally what a control flow graph looks like. Um, and um, the control flow graph in this case, uh, which I think y'all will talk about later, um, the benefit of this representation is you can um, reason about how information and control flows through the program. Um, and in particular, there's a class of really useful analysis um, algorithms called data flow algorithms that allow you to kind of track properties through the program. So for example, you can track that all, all things that were used were initialized, um, all variables. So the way you would do that is you would um, find out um, you would you perhaps like create a side table here that says, okay, two was um, created and it was initialized. And then we can look later and see, um, is it used? And likewise, we can go work backwards. So we could start later and we say, oh, um, three was used. And then we work backwards and try to find out if it's initialized in all possible predecessors. So for example, if we, if it's only initialized in this um, in like one side of a conditional, uh, that might not be okay because you might be, uh, you might not have initialized it in the other case. Uh, so this is a, a really useful class of algorithms. Um, and oops, how to go back. Yeah, so the mirror is a control flow graph. It enables a bunch of these sorts of things. And in particular, um, the borrow checker is largely based on um, information from the type checker, which we got earlier, and from the from a bunch of data flow analyses, where we can look at um, where references are defined and where they're used. Um, and uh, at a high level, the borrow checker collects a set of points in the program where a reference can be used. And then we can look and see if that overlaps with other sets. Um, and if we have like a mutable reference that overlaps with an immutable reference, that's an error. Um, the other benefit of the control flow graph is that it's very close to, like it's a very low level representation. So it's somewhat easy now because we have these basic blocks and we have a bunch of fairly low level instructions to generate code from that. Um, notably the mirror is still generic. Um, so, 
at this point, we still have generic types, um, but it's very easy to go from the mirror to a monomorphized form and then from monomorphized form to generic uh, or to um, generated LLVMIR. Um, and then one other thing is the compiler actually does a bunch of rest level optimizations here. So for example, you can do a lot of dead code elimination um, purely based on types. If you know that, uh, for example, a type, um, uh, for example, there is a type called the empty type, which you can't instantiate. Um, and if the compiler sees that, it knows that any code that has that type is dead code. So you can just eliminate it. That's something that Rust can do, but LLVM doesn't have enough information to do. Um, the, does that make sense? Cool. So finally, there's LLVM IR. Um, and this happens after um, the uh, uh, monomorphization and um, Rust optimizations, all of that. Um, and LLVM will take that and do its magic and output a binary. So something to note from all of that is that the language design of your programming language influences the performance of your compiler. Um, one example, which you should already be familiar with, is that the complexity of parsing your grammar affects how much time you parse your grammar. Um, and so uh, that affects your compiler performance ultimately. Um, another one is monomorphization. This is a big one in Rust because Rust has lots of generics um, and lots of generic types. And stamping out copies of every type that's generic takes a long time. Um, and so that can slow down compilation significantly. Um, the expressiveness of the type system, um, in particular, um, borrow checking and traits um, can take a lot of time, um, especially if you have large um, programs. There are mitigating factors here. So Rust tries to make all analyses local. Um, so you should only, you, you never have to um, borrow check more than one function at a time. Um, and so that kind of limits the size of the problem. Um, constant evaluation. Constant evaluation happens, I believe, after monomorphization. So you could find yourself doing a lot of evaluation. Um, there's a lot of other static analyses. Those are all different passes that have to run over different IRs. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, Rust tries to do local analyses most of the time. So that limits the, um, the size of the problem, but it requires that you have some programming language constraints. So for example, in Rust, you have to um, specify all types in your function header. Um, the compiler won't infer them. And that means that I can always type check an entire function without reference to any of the rest of the program. Um, not only does the programming language design influence the performance, it also uh, influences the compiler design. So the, the biggest one is the query incremental compilation um, design. Um, as we saw, that's because Rust is designed without header files and without smaller units of compilation on its own. Um, an interesting one that uh, I've seen mentioned elsewhere is nested functions. Um, so there, uh, Rust allows you to define functions within functions um, and macros within functions and so on. And that means that you actually have extra levels that you have to search when you do name resolution. Um, and surprisingly, that can actually cost time. Um, borrow checking, um, because borrow checking happens late in the compilation process, um, has to use this kind of um, mid-level IR, um, it means that you can't generate code until late in the compilation process, even if you've already checked other parts of the program. Um, monomorphization, as I mentioned, um, uh, it means that you want to do 
all of your analyses on generic code if you can, because otherwise you're going to spend a lot of time going over all of these different copies. Um, and that actually has limitations on um, like what the compiler can do. Um, so for example, um, at some point in the program, we want to erase lifetime information because uh, we don't want to carry it around forever. But that means that um, you can't have um, you can't have you can't specialize based on the lifetime. Basically, um, what that means is like you can't have an implementation that applies if you have, say, a static reference to something versus uh, on the stack reference, um, which is something you might want to do. But you can't do that without um, doing post monomorphization analyses. Um, and then um, interesting experimental one is traits. Um, there's a lot of experimental features that people want to add to the trace system in Rust um, that are such as like higher higher order, um, so higher kinded types. So like, like more layers of abstractions um, similar to say Haskell. Uh, but doing these requires a lot of complex solvers to actually do trait solving. Uh, and then there's a bunch of non-textbook choices that the compiler makes. So um, an example is queries, which we saw a few times. Um, another one that I find quite interesting is the way parsing is done. Um, the grammar is not like designed to be a specific class of grammar. Um, it's a handwritten, um, the parser itself is a handwritten recursive descent parser. And the grammar is just whatever the parser happens to do. Um, the reason it's done that way is first that um, we want to be able to parse kind of weird special cases as they come up. So perhaps there's a, a syntactic feature that we want to add, but adding it in a normal way would cause an ambiguity. But we know that, um, you know, we can, we can, if we look an extra token ahead in this one case, uh, then we can resolve the ambiguity. And the, the Rust parser actually does that sort of stuff, surprising amount, um, to just to avoid ambiguities or to avoid breaking changes or that sort of thing. Um, and then this, this makes it challenging if, like, say, some, some group wants to build a different Rust compiler. Yes. Like, the grammar is not defined, it's, it's hard coded. The grammar is defined, but it's um, it's not it doesn't fit any like predefined pattern. So yes, it is harder, and it actually also comes up when you're building IDEs. Uh, that like I want to build like a syntax highlighter for Rust, um, and it's a pain to do. Um, in fact, um, I, I use Vim, and Vim uses regexes, and you can't parse Rust with regexes. Um, you can get pretty close for most languages. Um, so like, I've never had problems with C, for example, but with Rust, a lot of times the syntax highlighter just gets really confused uh, because the grammar follows this very strange pattern. Um, so in the Rust community uh, of developers, um, other developers, is there contention about how, how the parser parsing is done or everyone agrees that this is a good idea? Um, there is some contention, but interestingly, the contention seems to be the other way. There are a bunch of um, experienced project developers that have been around for a while that are actually arguing that um, that we should abandon LR parsing and LL parsing altogether. Um, and uh, are actually advocating to have a context-free grammar, um, which I find kind of surprising. And I don't know if I agree with that or not, but uh, their argument is that the asymptotic worst case it might be bad, but in practice, you can avoid it usually. Um, so, you can like handle special cases when people file um, uh, bug reports that their program, the, the compiler hangs or uses a huge amount of memory or something, uh, which has happened in the past. Um, 
And usually they just like insert a special case. If we have a program with this structure, handle it with this optimized path. Um, and so that's kind of, it feels like kind of a departure from traditional designs. Um, so just, just to give everyone context, so the LLLR um, on this slide, these are subsets of context-free grammars. So not any arbitrary context-free grammar. They can be uh, parsed uh, more efficiently than, a, than an arbitrary context-free grammar. Uh, so here, it seems like Rust is, could be even not even context-free. Is that what you're saying? Is that what, what that says? Um, Maybe it's context-free. I don't know. I think it's context-free, but I don't know. Um, and I don't think anyone has proven anything about it. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's kind of, I find it kind of an interesting choice. Um, it's kind of a very practical engineering choice with unclear implications, but it seems to be working so far. Um, and then uh, kind of along with that is that the parser itself is handwritten. It's not a, it's not a parser generator. Um, so, uh, and the primary reason for that is that the parser does a lot of really like specialized handling of errors. Uh, so for example, the parser actually detects if you're using Python um, syntax and corrects you uh, and suggests something correct. Um, or C++, like the, um, if you use C++, you know there's like a semicolon after struct definitions. There isn't in Rust, but that's a common thing people do. So um, the compiler tries to recover from those sorts of things and not only emit a suggestion, but try to continue as if your code was correct um, so that you can get like type errors and stuff, even though your syntax is wrong. Can I, uh, you know, like, uh, like you add one case, like how, how do you change like, like all the edge cases? That is a great question, and we'll talk about testing in a little bit. Um, but that's a that's an excellent um, and very practical question. Um, yeah, and the, the other thing is, there's a lot of IRs in this compiler. There's five IRs. Some of them are quite substantial, um, and to my knowledge, other compilers don't use nearly so many conversions from one form to another. Um, it leads to the kind of longer time because you have to build um, each new IR. Um, it leads to increased memory usage. It makes your compilation cache bigger, but it enables a lot of static analyses. So like the mirror was designed specifically for the new borrow checker that made it a lot um, smarter than it used to be. They're completely different. So, or some of them are completely different. So, the um, here is uh, kind of a desugared AST. Here, uh, the THIR is typed here is like a typed HIR. Um, so, those are kind of similar, um, but MIR is completely different. Um, is uh, it's not even a tree, it's a big um, control flow graph. And then LLVM, LLVM IR is really more like a typed assembly um, than, uh, than a control flow graph or a tree. So they are really, really different. Um, yeah. Other questions? Um, so there's a bunch of considerations beyond just trying to generate functionally correct code. Um, one of them is that it turns out users care about their development experience. Um, so error messages and linting and that sort of thing, there's actually a significant amount of infrastructure in the compiler just for generating error messages, um, including uh, tracking the locations in the code all the way through the, the compiler, right? So if you end up with a, an error in LLVM, we want um, to be able to point back to the construct in the original source code. In order to do that, we need to track all the way through. Um, likewise with type errors, right? We need to know where the type was used in the original source code. 
Um, and there's a lot of extra analyses that are used to recover from errors um, in the most like probable way that what the user probably meant if we can, so that we can keep compiling and give them more useful information. Um, there's extra analyses to give suggestions. So like maybe you meant this type instead of this one or try adding a lifetime here or try dereferencing this value or something like that. Um, and then the other thing is debugging info, um, which is surprisingly hard to do right. Um, and it's kind of made harder for Rust that um, a lot of the current debugging tools are oriented towards C or C++. So if you use GDB, GDB doesn't have enums, it doesn't have closures, doesn't have um, generic types in a lot of the same ways that Rust does, doesn't have traits. Um, and Rust has to kind of incorporate all of those sorts of things. Um, and there are a lot of patches that are sent downstream to GDB or um, LLVB or other debugging tools so that they can understand Rust's um, symbol mangling and so on. Um, the developer environment itself is also um, a big deal that is, seems kind of like not part of the compiler, but it influences the compiler. Um, so in most Rust developers don't invoke Rust C directly. They invoke Cargo, uh, which does kind of dependency management and manages the, the compilation cache and all sorts of stuff. Um, and version resolution and all of that stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff with respect to IDEs. So um, with, so for example, you might want to allow um, partial compilation. So I, I want to get co code completions, even though my syntax is broken, right? I'm still writing the rest of this line of code. That means I need to be able to compile a partial line of code, um, which is kind of a weird thing that most people don't think about. Um, there's, um, as I said, handling of incorrect inputs so that you can suggest things. There's um, response time. So um, like how long it takes to get a suggestion or to get an error from the compiler um, affects developer um, experience a lot. If you have to sit there and wait for a minute every time you want to find out what the next error is, that's really aggravating. Um, and then um, when you're working on something before you, like you're just trying to get something to compile, a lot of times you don't actually want to generate code. You just want to see the next error message. And you're, you don't want to run optimizations. You, you, like you just want some static analysis. So these are all kind of like unconventional things that are like usually you think of compiling as generating code, well, like a binary or something. But um, these are kind of alternate modes that are interesting, that are still useful. Um, there is also compiler performance, um, how long it takes to compile. Um, as I mentioned, there's incremental compilation. You can choose to turn off optimizations because a lot of them are slow. Um, and you can do check only builds. A lot of these things are like when you're developing, you just want something really fast uh, when you're compiling. And then there's the memory usage and the disk usage. Um, over time, your incremental compilation cache can get kind of large because you're kind of you keep adding stuff to it. Um, so there's some art to like um, removing, like, like how do you know when to, when to delete the old compilation cache? Or do you just let the user clear their cache when it gets big enough and they're annoyed? So there's a bunch of engineering considerations as well. Um, so um, one of the biggest things that impacts the compiler is the stability guarantees of the programming language. So um, one of the guarantees is that we, we don't like to have breakage. People like their programs to be compiling the next time they try. If they come back to it in a, a year or a month or whatever, it's really annoying if you then have to go figure out why your program doesn't compile anymore. Um, that means that there's some tension between fixing bugs in the compiler and not breaking people's stuff. And um, that policy, the, the policy that they've adopted is to be 
to lean towards stability that we only make breakage if you if it's a, like a safety bug in the compiler like we accepted code that's clearly wrong or we shouldn't be accepting it um, or if the bug is like extremely rare and wild and that's often tested using this tool called crater uh, which literally downloads all of the crates um, on the package repository and on github and tries to compile them um, and this uh, it's actually a pretty cool tool um, it takes a few days to run um, and uh, it generates this giant report and over time they've kind of filtered out the more noisy ones um, and this tool is run kind of every time they make a release every time they want to see if uh, change breaks some code um, or how prevalent a particular paradigm is in the wild um, and then a lot of times it's you come up with like, like you have a correctness bug that you want to fix, but a lot of people are making this, this mistake. And if you just flipped a switch, you would just break a ton of stuff all at once. So instead what they'll do is they'll add a compatibility lint, um, something like that, um, which says, hey, you used this pattern that we didn't mean to stabilize or that we want to deprecate or whatever. And it's currently allowed, but this is going to be an error. So this is a like compiler warning doesn't abort the compilation, but um, it'll keep annoying you until you fix it, um, or it eventually becomes an error. Um, to your question, there's a ton of testing. Um, so um, the primary test suite in Rust-C is this UI test suite. So you um, take a program, um, you compile it, and then you compare the output of the compiler with the expected output of the compiler. And um, it tests the verbatim match. So uh, this means that you can't have extra errors that you weren't expecting. You have to get the errors that you were expecting to be there. Um, and um, most of the analyses are tested like this, including the parser and the um, lexer. So, um, whenever someone adds like a feature or someone adds, uh, you know, an extra error message or something, the code review on the repository usually requires that they add a UI test um, for a bunch of different cases. And it's kind of up to the reviewer to say, no, these aren't enough or this is more than enough or whatever. And on top of that, when they stabilize features, um, part of the stabilization process is to say what tests are there for this feature. Um, so uh, and that a lot of that is because of the stabilization guarantees that once you've stabilized something, it's really hard to fix it. Um, there's also a bunch of heavier weight tests. So um, there are some tests that check for different optimizations. Um, they will um, run a program through the compiler and then make sure that the um, the mirror looks a certain way or the LLVM IR looks a certain way or they'll run it through GDB and make sure that um, certain debugging symbols are there, so on. Um, these are kind of slow and really annoying, but um, usually most people don't need to run them because they don't touch those parts of the compiler. So uh, there's a bunch of other standard practices, integration and regression tests. Um, if you fix a bug, add a test that you don't add the bug back. Um, the um, continuous integration system runs the entire test suite every time anyone commits, um, which is actually really frustrating because it takes like two or three hours to run. Um, and, and so on. Um, an interesting thing is this um, kind of stable beta nightly channels. Um, the stable channel is kind of the released version that has guarantees on it. Beta and nightly are for testing purposes. Um, and it goes on like a six week cycle. So once you land a feature in the nightly um, compiler, it'll be stable 12 weeks later. Um, and this is kind of the way that people test it. Um, the other really big thing is this notion of dog fooding. Um, so 
if you've never heard this expression before, it's like the eat your own dog food. Um, so the compiler uses unstable features in the implementation of the compiler. Um, that allows them to test that those features are working correctly and so on. Um, and because the compiler is a very large and very advanced code base, um, it's actually a pretty good test of a lot of features. Um, and it also allows the exploration of the design space if people aren't really sure how to do stuff. Um, the other really like weird thing is bootstrapping. So um, Rust-C and the standard library of Rust are both implemented in Rust. That means that to compile the Rust compiler, you need a Rust compiler. So where does the first compiler come from? Uh, so I'm curious, does anyone have ideas? How does, yeah. Uh, so that's a, a great question. I think what you said was, can you bootstrap Rust-C from mRust-C? Uh, sorry, I can't quite hear. Yeah, so there's another alternate compiler implementation called mRust-C, which is actually in C++. Um, and indeed, you can do that, but that's not what the standard compiler does. Um, so in fact, what the compiler does is you use an older version of the compiler. Um, and on the surface of it, this seems fairly simple, but it's not. Um, so this is the steps to build a fully functioning Rust compiler. Um, and it's very confusing. Um, the reason it's confusing is, uh, the reason it's confusing is that the um, Rust language doesn't have a stable ABI, meaning that if you compile something with an older compiler, um, the binary that's emitted is not compatible necessarily with the new binary with another compiler. Um, that means that you can't compile the compiler and then use it with the compiled binaries that you get from that compiler. Um, so, uh, Sorry, that's kind of what I just said. Um, the idea here, the solution is to use this two-stage bootstrapping scheme. Um, so you build an intermediate compiler with the beta version, and then you use the new intermediate version to compile itself. Um, and because the intermediate version has a stable ABI, you can then use that the compiler that you compiled the second time with the standard library that you compiled the second time. Um, and I find that really confusing personally. Um, it causes no end of confusion. Um, however, this does allow you to do kind of relatively fast paced dog fooding. Um, so you have to, you can use new features in the compiler or the standard library six weeks after they land in the compiler, because that's when the binary uh, beta compiler will support them. Um, and that's where your bootstrapping chain starts. In the interest of time, we have yeah. one minute left. So maybe you, um, every year when people take this class, some people get enchanted by compilers and want to do more. So if they want to get into you know, hacking it on Rust, it's, it seems like a very intimidating you know, yeah. compared to the, to the academic compiler that we build here. How, what is the entry point? Where do they start? Um, that's a great question. So um, I have this link here, Rust C Dev Guide. Um, it's meant to be a guide on how the compiler works. Um, and it's, uh, there's a ton of helpful people. Um, if you're interested in in working on this, um, there's um, on this Zulu chat, it's this big chat forum where a bunch of the compiler writers hang out. and. They love to incorporate new people. Um, I started with a typo fix in a README. So um, you can ramp up and go a lot of places. I ended up touching the borrow checker. I ended up touching um, like doing major refactoring. I did some error message work. Um, so uh, yeah. And I've seen other people go from like nothing to like doing type system work 
pretty quickly, which is, I think, one of the more complicated parts of the compiler. So, yeah. That's kind of what I got. Thanks, Mark.